that was an incredible blessing to get to share in worship this morning in that way. And um, I come to you with a message from Psalms 84, verses 8 through 12. Hear now the reading of God's word. Hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. For the Lord is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who, whose walk is blameless. Lord Almighty, blessed is the one who trusts in you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I once knew a man who left his dream job. He had a fabulous career. He was good at what he did. He loved his coworkers. He made a ton of money. He had a nice life, lived in a nice town. Everything was working out so good for him. Why would he have left his job? He left his job because he thought God wanted him to leave his job. He was in a Bible study, and it was a disciple Bible study, as a matter of fact, and he learned about personal responsibility and social responsibility, and his son was learning things at school, and it turned out this gentleman in his job, he worked for Big Tobacco. And as he was in the Bible study, and as his seven-year-old son would come home from school every day and talk about the things they were learning, and sometimes they were learning about the ways that tobacco damages your body and smoking and all that. He looked in his son's eyes, he looked into the word of God, and he realized he had no choice but to find another job if he was going to follow God's call in his life to please the Lord. And so he took another job that was harder, that was longer hours, and was significantly less pay. He wanted to do God's will. I first read about this doorkeeper that is imagined by the psalmist as a teenager. I was new to Bible study. I was practically drowning in knowledge and experiences that I didn't really have the maturity to handle. I was having a tough time. I knew a lot of things that at that time I would have rather not known and I had many challenges. On a whim one day, I cracked open a Bible, and I think that whim is really God's grace. But that Bible was given to me in my church in the third grade, and meeting God in Holy Scripture was in every way a lifesaver for me. It gave me hope. It, it helped me be ushered into an awareness of the presence of the Lord. If I was too tired to read that Bible, I read it every night, and if I was too tired to read it at the day's end, I got to where I'd read it standing up. And I'm not telling you that to tell you that I was a really good kid or something like that. What I'm telling you is that the Word of God changed my life. The Word of God told me something about trusting God. The Word of God told me about following God. The Word of God helped me to know God. And it helped me to fall in love with God. I learned grace through the Word of God. I fell in love with God through His Word, and I read about that doorkeeper. And without a lot of theological training or input from other sources, I gathered that that person was somebody who had to stand in the sun all day, away from what was exciting, doing what God needed to be done. I imagine that person standing there and greeting all the people as they walked in, all of, all of the uh, worshipers, and I thought... Yeah, that would be a thankless job because you wouldn't get to be in the middle of everything. But it was a job that God wanted done. It was a job without prestige, a job that maybe nobody else wanted to do, apparently. I knew that, but I can tell you that at 16 years old, if somebody had invited me to be something akin to a doorkeeper, to do the least little thing for God, I think I would have done it. Because I needed him. I needed his grace. Well, I still need his grace, but my life turned out a little differently than what I thought it would. I, I 
I ended up being called to preach. I had conversations and charismatic experiences that made my call evident. And I had the support of my family. Not everybody in my church or community was comfortable with a woman being called to preach. And in my church, it was the second woman, and that was way too much. But I had the witness of female prophets and evangelist leaders in Scripture. Paul's instruction of how women should be attired when they did lead worship, which is recorded in Scripture. And to me, the Scripture gives a clear witness that women are welcome in the pulpit. Women are welcome in spiritual leadership in, in all the different capacities that are available. And that was my strength. And then and now there are people in positions of authority that might make it sound like Scripture doesn't support a woman's calling in ministry in order to accomplish their own agenda, and that is simply untrue. The Bible has been a life-giving thing for me because the Holy Spirit has used it. And with the Holy Spirit and the witness of the Bible, the affirmations of a few around me, that was enough to help me step into my call. So I went to seminary, and I thought... I was going to be happy to be a doorkeeper and ready to do whatever God called me to. And I kind of assumed that's kind of what seminary was about. And seminary was amazing, but I have to tell you, there was another spirit in seminary. And it's a spirit that continues kind of throughout my career. I guess it's just in part maybe something about growing up rather than about seminary in particular. But... Sometimes we talked about serving wherever we were called to serve, and sometimes we talked about trying to get the best role we possibly could get so we could have the kind of life we wanted. So that in seminary, that was the first time I ever heard a church called a promotion. And even worse, it's the first time I ever heard a church called a demotion. Wow. Pastors are lured into looking for status and position as people were in ancient times, the people who were loath to become the doorkeeper, the people who didn't want to miss the honors and the perks of position. Wickedness. That's what the psalmist says about the tents that he could be dwelling in instead of standing out in the hot sun should he ever have to become a doorkeeper for the Lord. The tents of wickedness. We don't use that word very often anymore. That word wicked, it's just so harsh and so cold and so extreme. I looked up the definition. I was just curious to see what it said. It said, wicked is immoral or evil that is consciously chosen. That's what it means to be wicked, to be immoral or evil in a way that is consciously chosen. It's not a mistake. It's an action that is thought out and chosen and I thought about those words, immoral and evil. Those are also strong words we don't really like to look at anymore too much. I mean, evil in somebody else, right? But not evil in us. It's, it's, uh, it, it's kind of like uh, last night we sang, let there be peace on earth. And I, I had to laugh because I had half-heartedly thought about doing a very different devotion. And, and one of the things I was going to say in that devotion was, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with you. Um, you know, it, it's quite possible to see evil in someone else. It's quite possible to see immorality in someone else, but to see it in ourselves? I mean, we're basically good people, right? But if we're looking at our lives from a self-serving viewpoint, to look at what is safe, to look at what is respectable, to look at what is definitely acceptable for the sake of being accepted, that is wicked, and by that standard, all of us are a little wicked once in a while. All of us keep silent when we ought to speak up once in a while because it might cost us. All of us have uh, challenges and, and dreams and hopes that we believe that manipulating our situation will get us to. All of us are occasionally trying to get to the tents of wickedness, replete with an overstuffed couch, the best TV you've ever seen, the best clothes, the best food, the cool people, whatever it is that we're looking for, we are trying to get to the tents of wickedness. That's pretty bad news. But the good news is that God calls us to something that gives us strength to live differently. God calls us to Jesus. Jesus Christ, who left behind the, the joy and the peace and the plenty of heaven 
to come and live among us. And the only place he could find that joy and peace and plenty of heaven mirrored perfectly was within his own heart and in his communion with God the Father. And yet he came. He came for his, because of his love for us. He came because we needed him to come. He came because he knew that we were tempted by the tents of wickedness. He came because he knew that our, in our minds, what we think of as our very best choices are often the very worst ones. He came to save us from sin, and he came to save us from ourselves. And that work of salvation is still available and ongoing for all of us so that we might live a different life. We might live the life of the joyful doorkeeper ready to do whatever it is God wants us to do. Ministers are not the only ones afflicted with this problem. As you remember my illustration at the beginning of the message, those of you in other careers also know the lure of making a reputation or making a nice life, whether God is in the middle of it or not. And in all of our pursuits, God's will can easily take a backseat to anything so long as we can get to the next desirable thing. Even in churches and communities, unpaid Jesus followers, right alongside the paid Jesus followers, are invited by God to ministries that are scary and are tedious, that are neither noticed nor honored. Ministries that mean we might have to leave our friend group and work with a different group of people. Ministries that might mean that we have to stand up for someone that all of our friends are willing to condemn. Ministries that might demand things of us that we're not sure we have to give. I don't know where you are in your journey toward trying to develop the spirit of a happy doorkeeper, but I hope and pray that I would still be willing at 46 to be the least for God as I would have been willing to be at 16. I don't know if I would not, but I hope I would. And I pray God will examine me for that and help me in that direction. I hope I'd be willing to be willing, really even satisfied to live in less affluence and more trials and greater obscurity if it were truly worth, worthy of the purposes of God. I hope I'd be willing to risk failing big to do something I thought God called me to do. I hope that for all of us, clergy and lay alike. Times are tough now and things are shaking up. There's a lot of uncertainty. The things that were secure maybe don't seem secure enough. The things that were predictable don't seem predictable enough. Safety is not in plenteous supply. Anything in us that is lured by what is easy, what is pleasant, what would make our lives uh, more enjoyable, anything that would bring us notoriety, any way that we've given room for that in our souls, Brothers and sisters, we are headed into a time of testing. We've been there, and we're headed even more deeply into that time. Being a doorkeeper gladly is not about a mindset that small is better, or behind the scenes is better. The psalmist is saying that God is better. God is better than easy living without him. God is better than the trappings of, of poorly earned wealth. God is better than honor for honor's sake. God is better than fun for fun's sake. The psalmist knows that God is enough. Whatever pleasure and plenty we grab and finagle and manipulate our way into without God, that will never be enough. It will never satisfy because there will always be another promotion. There will always be another luxury item. There will always be another fun experience diversion. There will always be something that could lure us away from living a life that blesses the people around us, living a life that answers God's call to serve others, God's call to give for others, God's call to speak out in ways that might cost us. We heard something about cost last night. I was listening. <laughs> What is acceptable changes. What seems stable and safe to us from our limited human perspective, it is but a breath. 
But God and his purposes are forever. And the things we do in the service of God, they are forever. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness, says the psalmist. What we say with our lips, may we strive to live out in our lives. And may Almighty God bless us in that calling. Living for God's will. Going where he calls us to go, doing what he calls us to do, no matter the consequence. Knowing that that journey is blessed in a way that living for ourselves cannot be blessed. Let us pray. God, we come here today and we are a people of many minds. We are a people of many concerns. Indeed, what was once said about the little town of Bethlehem might be said about this very room. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee. Lord, you meet us here in the midst of fear and trembling and distractions and worries. And you speak your powerful truth that you are enough, that your call is good, that your ways are good, that your will is good, and that trusting you leads to a life of meaning and joy, a life that cannot be bought, a life that cannot be faked, a life that is authentic and real. Help us, God, to be alive in you. Help us, God, to, to, as John Wesley said, be employed for you or laid aside for you, exalted for you or brought low for you. Help us, God, to live for you regardless of what we think might happen and knowing that you hold tomorrow. Use your church, we pray, O oh God. Unleash us into our communities to share the freedom of Jesus with all we meet. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.